Hello and welcome to this episode of The Insight, where we're talking about Turkey and their foreign policy. If you like our content, then please like, share and subscribe. I'm Michael McKay, the CEO of Intelligence Fusion, and I'm joined today by Max Taylor, our Senior Regional Analyst for Asia, as well as Viraj Patni, our Senior Regional Analyst for Africa. We're also joined by Aaron Arends, one of our Regional Analysts. And we're joined on the phone for the first time by Panagiotis Vasilius, who is our Associate Analyst who looks at Turkey and has looked at Turkey for us for the past three years. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me. What I also should point out is that we're actually using a big screen in the office today. So the analysts, when they're actually describing the ground situation, um, they will show that um, and it'll be brought up on the screen um, showing the actual activities on the ground. So Turkey has all the hallmarks of consolidating into an authoritarian regime. The country's leadership is opening up multiple political and military fronts, whether that's sending troops and equipment to Azerbaijan or redefining maritime borders with Libya in an attempt to control natural resources in the Mediterranean. At a time when support for President Erdogan's AK party is waning, foreign policy appears to be Erdogan's tactic to unite the country behind his leadership. Recent events have seen Turkey throw its support behind Azerbaijan, as a decades-old territorial dispute has fled into a conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh. Erdogan has described Turkey's support for Azerbaijan as part of Turkey's quest for its deserved place in the world order. So Max, can you first of all just explain the events on the ground that has set off this recent escalation and what the current situation looks like? Sure. So the fighting in the Gorno Karabakh region began on September the 27th. And since then, the front lines have changed relatively little. And the, as you can see from our incidents on the map here, the, they follow the edge of the Gorno Karabakh region. So the fighting has been largely restricted to these border regions as Azerbaijani forces have attempted to attack parts of the uh, Armenian backed in the Gorno Karabakh Republic. And the fighting so far has mostly taken place in this northern region around the city of Martikert, and as well as in the south in the Fusili Jibreil region. So I'll start in the south, where we've seen what seems to be limited gains by Azerbaijani forces from this frontline area here. And at one point, Azerbaijani forces have actually claimed to have taken Jibreil itself, which again is an unconfirmed report and it does need to be more verified. But it does suggest that Azerbaijani forces do have, at least have claimed to have pushed this far into Nagorno-Karabakh. So if true, this is quite a large incursion compared to elsewhere on the front line. We've also seen fighting all along here and and, uh, artillery shelling of villages as well as major towns which are a bit further away from the front lines as both sides have access to heavy artillery such as smirch uh, rocket artillery systems as well as uh, systems such as 203mm artillery fire which we've seen deployed throughout the front line. In the central area around here we've seen much less activity reported in both sides media. And this doesn't necessarily mean that nothing's going on. It just simply means that there's a bit more quiet than elsewhere, as media reports from the area have been quite uh, quite thin on the ground at times, and suddenly you get a few reports with uh, referencing locations. And again, up in the north, as we said a, a minute ago, we've seen another con- uh, area of concentration of incidents. There's been heavy artillery fire around villages and towns here, including major towns such as Bada and Martikert itself. There's been journalists on both sides of the front line filming these shellings, so we know for a fact that artillery fire has been targeting these civilian population centres on both sides. We've also seen some actual quite uh, quite major fighting around uh, a village of Talish, just north of Martikur here. And Azerbaijani forces do actually claim to have captured this this village, and they have released videos on uh, on sites such as Telegram as well as on their own MOD website of uh, claiming to show Azerbaijani forces in the village itself. And again, this needs to be confirmed via geolocation and uh, other uh, compiled reports. Just on that, how have you actually found geolocating incidents on the ground? Because it looks to be a fairly sparsely populated area with very few natural as well as man-made um, sites and locations to actually accurately geolocate incidents. Yeah, I'm glad you asked. It's um, it's quite a difficult task actually. It's in it's quite time consuming as well, which has been one of the issues we face. And as you said, it is very sparsely populated. And actually, along this front line area here, a lot of these towns and villages have actually been uh, depopulated in order because they're, they're because of the frequency of clashes. So a lot of people have moved out of the area. So geolocation has been very difficult, especially with most of this fighting taking place in rural areas away from uh, city centres and street signs that we often rely on for uh, geolocation. With that said, it is possible. So it is possible to look at the uh, terrain in the background, for example. But again, this is very time consuming. We found in order so the result has been in order to verify these news reports that are coming out, which at times have been of pretty suspect quality. It has been it's, it's necessary in order to to eliminate anomalies and data, for example, of one side claiming to have captured a town which they simply haven't captured. But it's been it's been a very time consuming process. But fortunately, um, it is possible. So it is, it is doable. So it, but then 
for the time being, we're getting data quite slowly, so we're able to handle it as it comes. There seems to be quite a lot of propaganda efforts on both sides of releasing footage and videos and images that we can use to actually help to geolocate some of these incidents. Yeah, for sure, yeah. And uh, interesting what you said about propaganda, actually, is both sides uh, have been accused of releasing video that's been deliberately emotive. And because conscripts have been used by both sides in this conflict, both sides have been accused of releasing video claiming to show 18-year-old soldiers essentially um, uh, cracking under the pressure of it. And uh, these, some of these videos are believed to be legitimate, but other ones are suspected to have been released by one side to try and to try and pretend that this is a, g a genuine video of the opposing side to try and reduce morale in their forces. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing these propaganda efforts, I guess you could call it, actually going quite deep and right down to a tactical level. And these videos aren't being disseminated by the MODs themselves. These are being disseminated by various social media accounts or followers of the conflict, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. So this propaganda has been a really important side of the conflict itself. And it's also been quite off-putting for us as analysts to try and then dig through it and actually find what's what's been compiled with other reports and what simply hasn't. Yeah. So moving on from, from that side of things, uh, and finally with nagorno Karabakh, what we've seen as well is this main road between Martika and Vardnes, Vardnes being an Armenian territory itself. At the start of the conflict, we actually saw quite a few reports of shelling along this main road, and presumably because this road is being used by Armenian forces to support the Martika area and the heavy fighting taking place around here. So we have seen shelling in, in villages just close to Vardnes itself, as well as unconformed reports of uh, Azerbaijani drone strikes in the area and shooting down the drones as well. Here I have a question about, because the drone strikes from Azerbaijan, mm. the videos we see, they suggest that they are Turkish drones or even maybe operated by Turkish forces. What and What's the significance of that? And do you know? Yeah, so drones are drones have been a really important part. And it's again, it's a good question because we don't actually know for sure whether these drones are being operated by Turkish pilots or mm -hmm. whether these B2 drones have been sold by Turkey to Azerbaijan. Because there was talks earlier this year, actually, in, uh, early this summer of uh, Azerbaijan, of, uh, B2 drones being sold to Azerbaijan. So it is possible that they are being piloted by Azerbaijani pilots. However, it's not implausible to suggest that Turkish pilots may also be involved in the piloting. But again, this is just speculation and no one knows for sure. So I'm not going to pretend that I know for sure mm -hmm. who's piloting it. But yes, you're right, to, you're right to ask because it is part of the Turkish involvement in this conflict with people speculating whether Turkey is actually piloting these drones, which would be quite a big factor. I mean, drones are you know, very complex things to actually fly and manoeuvre. Mm. I think back in the days of um, sort of the early British military drones, they were flew by sort of professional um, um, sort of model aircraft pilots. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously the technology has evolved since then, but I think they are still very um, complex um, uh, objects to actually, devices to actually use. So it wouldn't surprise me either if it is actually Turkish operators actually flying these drones. Mm. Yeah, I think it's... Um I think that's a good point, actually, especially with the, with the drones only having been sold to, allegedly sold to Azerbaijan quite recently as well. I imagine it takes more than a couple of months to train pilots up, especially to be active in a theatre such as this. So yeah, I think it's a good point. It is So it's not, to answer your question directly, it's not mm. impossible that Turkish pilots are controlling the drones. But again, we can't say for sure. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for that, Max. A question for you, Panagiotis. So bringing it back to Turkey, which is obviously the topic of this podcast, can you explain for us how Turkey is involved in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict? Turkey has been Azerbaijan's long-lasting ally offering consistent political support for its stance on the Nagorno-Karabakh dispute. What we see now, directly linked to the conflict, is a change in Ankara's rhetoric with Turkish officials empowering Azerbaijan's President Aliyev to act against Armenia, with Turkish President Erdogan recently stating that the time has come for Azerbaijan to take the matter into its own hands. The military aspect is present, of course. Ar Armenia's foreign ministry claimed that Turkey has transferred weapons, including drones and electronic warfare systems, to Azerbaijan, and Turkish military experts are fighting side by side with Azerbaijan's military. Azerbaijan's president denied Turkey's involvement, stating that such rumors by Armenia are provocative. The president of the Artsakh Republic mentioned that Turkey's F-16 fighter jets participate in the offensive and Armenia accused Turkey of shooting down one of its Su-25 fighter jets over Armenian territory with a pilot killed as a result. Both Turkey and Azerbaijan rejected this claim. Both sides also accused each other for hiring mercenaries in this conflict. According to Azerbaijan's defense ministry, Mercenaries of Armenian origin from Syria have been identified among Armenia's casualties, with Turkish Minister of Defense Hulusi Akar calling Armenia to send back the mercenaries and terrorists they brought from abroad. 
CNN Turk also reported that at the end of July, around 300 PKK members were transported to Armenia and Karabakh by buses to train Armenian militias. Armenia's ambassador to Moscow said that Turkey has sent around 4,000 fighters from northern Syria to Azerbaijan. Setting aside the up to this time unverified accusations of both sides hiring mercenaries, what seems to be of importance is the deployment of Turkish made unmanned combat aero vehicles, which continue to destroy military positions and vehicles of the Armenian forces at the mountainous area of Nagorno Karabakh. Thanks, Panagiotis. So, Max, can you just explain um, in a bit more depth tactically what you've seen in terms of drone use in the conflict? Yeah, so we just spoke about the uh, involved uh, Turkish sale of drones, but we've also seen other types of drones active in the conflict as well. In particular, we've seen Israeli supplied suicide drones, as they're often called, being supplied to, uh, to Israel. And there's been quite a few different types, but as we've seen from the videos being released from the conflict, these suicide drones have had a really very significant impact on the fighting. And the reason for that, there's multiple reasons for this, but one of the main reasons is a lot of the equipment we're seeing involved in the fighting is uh, is mostly from the Soviet era. So we're seeing, seeing a lot of T-72 and T-90 main battle tanks on both sides of the conflict with quite antiquated AA systems, which are also from the Cold War Soviet era. And a lot of these AA systems simply can't track the uh, can't track the, the drones that are being used in the conflict right now. So we're seeing these drones actually targeting the AA systems, which have been set up specifically to try and counteract the drones. And the result is, once the AA is being uh, eliminated by these suicide drones, these main battle tanks, which have costed both sides thousands and thousands of dollars, these main battle tanks are completely vulnerable and are very expensive targets for what are comparatively much cheaper suicide drones. So I wouldn't say that these drones have completely revolutionized the way that the war is going, but I would say that both sides are being forced to evolve and both sides are being forced to rethink the type of AA they're using, because without sophisticated and more importantly modern AA coverage. These very expensive armored personnel carriers and main battle tanks that both sides are using in quite large numbers are incredibly vulnerable and we're seeing massive losses in both sides. And both sides actually have quite limited amounts of vehicles uh, compared to other major armies. So without any adjustment, I think these drones can have a really significant role in undermining the use of armored warfare, which many people throughout the 20th century have seen as a key part of modern conflict. So yeah, I think at a tactical level, these drones have I wouldn't say revolutionized conflict because at the end of the day it's very they're still very similar to standard airstrikes but they have certainly evolutionized the way that uh, militaries are having to uh, having to approach these t- these con- conflicts and certainly having to rethink their use of AA as, as a at a tactical level not just at a strategic level and there must be a massive psychological impact on the troops on the ground you know it's it's one thing to have the standard drones which actually, which actually fire munitions it's another with these what are essentially loitering munitions and um, that are just flown out and just kind of hovered around the area and then just striking targets. Um, in terms of the air defence, are we actually seeing any successes from the air defence units on either side? Seemingly so, yes. So we've seen a few incidents, which I'll just show on the platform now, of drones being shot down. So the uh, Armenian forces claim to have shot down a drone here near to Vahadanias. And we've seen multiple reports uh, along the front line as well. We've seen quite a few unconfirmed reports of uh, attack helicopters and troop transport helicopters, as well as the observation plane itself being shot down. But again, the, uh, these are slow moving targets. So we, in terms of actual attack drones, the amount of drones being used and the amount of videos we're seeing of successful drone strikes completely does, well, appears at the moment to completely outweigh the number of drones we're seeing shot down. I believe one of the points of these loitering munition type drones as well is you can shoot down a few, but the whole point is you've got to shoot down all of them because it only takes one to cause a quite significant impact on a military position. Yeah. And what we're seeing is, I'm, I'm, in the videos, particularly the ones released by Azerbaijan, is that these drones aren't just being used to tar- target high value targets anymore. It's not just tanks. They're also targeting, uh, they're also targeting troops, for example, that are sleeping in, in a campsite. So they're, they're using them against relatively small targets now. And as you said about the psychological impact, it seems that it's not they're not just uh, one-off weapons anymore. They've very much become to characterise this conflict itself. Mm-hmm. What sort of air defence units are both sides using? Again, as I was saying earlier about they're quite old, but we're seeing uh, OSA AA systems, which, again, they've been updated throughout the years, but they are still fairly old. Armenia is believed to have S-300s, but again, the S-300 we've seen in Syria time and time again has not managed to interdict Israeli airstrikes in southern Syria. And in fact, not a single Israeli aircraft has been shot down by these S-300s. So... The, the value of these AA systems, which are often quite old and antiquated compared to modern technology, just simply aren't cutting up to it. And we're seeing a lot of, uh, of uh, short to medium range AA as well. But again, the short to medium range AA is also what we're seeing being targeted time and time again in these videos released by both sides. So 
it's all well and good having the AA itself, but if it's completely ineffective against these modern Israeli and, and uh, Turkish drones, then they are essentially just expensive targets. Yeah. Thanks, Max. So, um, Panagiotis, just expanding on your previous point, can you explain what you think Turkey will achieve from supporting Azerbaijan in this conflict? On domestic level, Turkey's active support to Azerbaijan empowers Erdogan's appeal not only to its nationalist anti-Armenian bloc, but also serves Erdogan's broader political needs as the country is facing an ongoing, rather surging pandemic and a prolonged economic crisis, with the Turkish lira reaching record lows against the dollar, euro and pound, which slowly but steadily erodes public support for Erdogan's policies. In broader terms, it promotes and further enforces Turkey's regional role as a powerful and influential actor capable of brokering deals with major powers. This has been a central theme in Turkey's foreign policy, with President Erdogan focusing on strongly condemning Russian operations in Idlib, in Syria, and US policies and tactics in the broader Middle East, especially regarding US support for the Kurdish Syrian Defense Forces, which Turkey considers as an existential threat. But also, it demonstrates its will to militarily oppose them. The Turkish involvement in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict signals Turkey's current or prospective allies that it is a credible force capable of supporting its allies despite the multiple battle theaters it is involved in. There has been a lot of discussion on if Turkey's military resources and general capacity is capable of supporting its presence in all fronts in Iraq, in Syria, Cyprus, Libya, in Eastern Mediterranean, just to name a few. But Turkey seems to have been careful in weighing the extent of its presence. No doubt, Turkey remains very, very vulnerable at all fronts, but it has managed, up to now at least, to have absorbed the military and political costs and sustain a presence able to influence ground developments. More importantly, by participating in multiple fronts, Turkey may be attempting to interlink the conflicts. We may as well think of communicating vessels where the pressure in, in one directly affects the other. Ultimately, it is an issue of managing the pressure in each of those and creating choke points to deliberately channel the intensity from one to the other. That, of course, entails major risk for Turkey, but major opportunities as well. Thanks. That's interesting. So what you're saying is it's a diversionary tactic to take attention away from the pandemic, as well as the um, economic handling um, within Turkey, as well as being an opportunity for Turkey to actually push their reputation as a major deal broker in the region by causing disruption. So um, a final question. What do you think are the implications of Turkey's support in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict? Continuous Turkey support, further Azerbaijan territorial gains and attacks in Armenian territory may force Armenia to request its main ally and security guarantor Russia to military intervene to its defense. And this reaction is what Turkey likely anticipates, not to directly militarily confront Russia, but likely to replicate a security mechanism we have seen previously in Syria and Libya a mechanism where Turkey and Russia, as opposing actors, agree on a ceasefire, establish security buffer zones, deploy troops and military equipment on each side, proceed with joint patrols along the borderline, and agree on a roadmap of negotiations to resolve the conflict. Such a development would mean that through the one nation, two states motto, Turkey will have the opportunity to expand its military footprint in Russia's backyard and actively participate in another front to pursue its foreign policy ambitions. A forwarded and prolonged presence of Turkish and Azerbaijani troops closer to Armenia will only fuel uncertainty in the region due to Armenia's growing military entrapment. As mentioned earlier, the risks entailed in such a development may exist, but Turkey, through a measured approach, may eventually succeed in establishing a potential pressure release valve to its east regarding its relations with Russia. With military costs to the side, President Erdogan will likely benefit from a ceasefire allowing him to display his personal determination and seek for justice in the international system, his commitment to pursuing Turkey's national goals, 
and the Turkish state's willingness and ability to fulfill its historical obligations to its regional allies. Further, Russia may feel compelled to readjust its policies towards Ankara in the face of this new development, to Turkey's benefit. Evidently, Turkey will increase its exposure to Russian aggressiveness by establishing its presence and confronting Moscow in Nagorno-Karabakh. Turkey already faces major challenges in its relations with Russia. In Syria, a looming Russian-backed Syrian offensive against Syrian jihad elements in Idlib province threatens Turkey's stationed troops and large-scale military deployments and may cause a refugee flow that Turkey will be called to address. In Libya's stalemate, disagreements over the ceasefire and Turkey's deployment of Syrian mercenaries frustrate President Putin, and domestically, Turkey has a number of Russia-led projects going on, notably the construction of Akuyu nuclear power plant in Mersin. Russia maintains its overall ability to compel Turkey's foreign policy, but Moscow benefits too much from these ambiguous relations with Ankara to severe them, at least for now. Even if Turkey's goals are limited to shifting the military balance on the ground and assisting Azerbaijan in pushing forward the line of conflict, it will be to President Aliyev's advantage when negotiations for a ceasefire begin, and most likely Turkey will attempt to capitalize on Aliyev's success. At the very least, we may see Turkish troops and additional military equipment, probably including Air Force assets, deployed to secure Azerbaijan's advancements. Thanks, Panagiotis. So moving away from the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, Max, can you just explain to us um, Turkey's involvement in both Iraq and Syria and what you think they're aiming to achieve? So I think Turkey's main goal in uh, Iraq and Syria can be best summarised as they are attempting to push back hostile Kurdish groups which are active in the border region as well as in the southeast of Turkey itself. So I'll start by just discussing Turkish involvement in Syria and then I'll move on to Iraq afterwards. So as we can see on the map right now, I've got a map of uh, all the incidents I've taken, that we've recorded in Syria in uh, 2020 to date. And Turkish operations throughout this year and throughout previous years have well up taking place in this northern area up here, where the Syrian National Army, formerly known as the Free Syrian Army, currently control most of the territory. And the Syrian National Army, or the SNA, is a, uh, a mixture of militias and various groups which have been put together and are backed in some way, shape or form by Turkey. And whilst the groups, they all do fight under the banner of the SNA, uh, it should be noted that infighting is actually quite common among these factions. So we do see, despite... Turkey's aim being to try and secure its borders. We do still see quite a lot of insecurity in these border regions around here. So Turkish operations have largely taken place up here where we see frequent artillery, exchanges of artillery fire and small arms fire between uh, Kurdish and uh, Turkish backed or even Turkish regular forces themselves. So is that artillery that is actually in Syria or it's in Turkey firing into Syria? Generally it varies, but Turkey does have a, uh, multiple self-propelled harrowitzes deployed at various positions in Syria itself. So it's, uh, I imagine a lot of this fire is coming from um, coming from Syria itself. However, with its proximity to the Turkish border, it's plausible to suggest that their Turkish artillery systems are firing from Turkey as well, particularly at these incidents that take place close to the border. And down here in Idlib is where we see a much more complicated part of Turkey's, uh, Turkey's intervention in Syria. The reason being, not all of the rebel groups in Idlib province are actually explicitly backed by Turkey. For example, Hayat Tahir al-Sham, otherwise known as HTS. Uh, whilst they are on the same side as the Syrian National Army rebels who are backed by Turkey, HTS don't actually receive direct support from Turkey as much as the SNA does. So Turkey is therefore faced with quite a difficult position of supporting HTS indirectly by supporting the rebels. And Russia has used this to bludgeon uh, Turkey's soft power and Turkey's image by claiming that Turkey is supporting a terrorist group in Idlib province. Regardless, the situation we see in Idlib is quite complicated as well on a more international scale because the Syrian government forces who have been carrying out multiple attacks and skirmishes around this border area of Idlib are backed by Russian forces who have also carried out the majority of these blue markers we can see here, which are airstrikes. Which so just for people who actually haven't seen our platform before, the dark blue is artillery or indirect weapons, the yellow is direct weapons, that's activity that's happening on the ground, and then the blue are aviation-related incidents. That's right, yeah. And so, as I was saying, the uh, Russian government forces, Russian-backed Syrian government forces have been responsible for most of the attacks on Turkish-backed rebels in the province. And this has put Turkey in a really awkward position because to try and interdict the Russian aircraft would be direct confrontation with Russia, leading to likely a direct uh, escalation between the two countries, which they're both looking to avoid. Mm -hmm. So we've seen Syria in quite a difficult position. And also behind the lines and areas around here in southern Idlib, we're seeing Turkish observation points whose, whose main role is to... Uh, 
monitor and prevent escalations and prevent ceasefire uh, violations in this border area between rebel and government forces. But as you can see from our platform, this simply isn't happening. In fact, a lot of the time, these observation posts, which, ma which are manned by regular Turkish forces, have actually been directly targeted, explicitly targeted by Russian-backed Syrian government forces, quite frequently leading to high casualties. And we've seen in the past, actually, direct... Uh, on the same day that Turkish forces have been directly targeted by Russian-backed forces, Turkish patrols have also been carrying out joint patrols with Russian military personnel elsewhere in Idlib or even in Aleppo province. So this is quite a complicated relationship and one in which, whilst both sides are actually indirectly clashing with each other's proxies, both sides are quite willing to let it remain as just a proxy conflict between the two. And we've seen very little direct engagement between Russia and Turkey itself in Syria. So just whilst you've got the platform up there, so the red icons, which are suicide and complex, who, who's actually conducting those attacks? These are very rarely actually claimed. But again, this goes back to whilst Turkey's aim is to secure this border region, it does, these red icons kind of highlight that that's not always been the case. It's just a different sort of insecurity to what they had before. So Islamic State do have a presence in the area, albeit much smaller than it used to be, as do Al-Qaeda affiliates such as Ahura Saudin who have actually been targeted by US drone strikes uh, infrequently throughout this throughout this year. But these red icons that we see, such as uh, vehicle bombs, suicide vehicle bombs and suicide bombing, tend to take place in major towns such as Azaz and Afrin. It's not always clear who, t who carried out these attacks. And in fact, they're not always claimed either. And when they are, it tends to be, it, it can be a, a number of groups. But uh, a lot of these, a lot of these bombings have taken place, uh, they're not targeting military targets, they're targeting civilian targets. So despite Turkey's aim here being to secure this border region along the Turkish border with Syria, there is still very high levels of insecurity present. And as we can see, there's still uh, quite large amounts of fighting which have been recorded this year as well. So to say that this is secure, I think would be premature. And what does the intervention in, in Iraq look like? In Iraq, it's, a, it's there's similar core themes, but there's much less Turkish regular involvement. So there's been Turkish uh, special forces operations throughout the northern Iraq area, as well as more often than not reported, is uh, these airstrikes that we've seen, again, nearly all exclusively carried out by Turkish, uh, Turkish aircraft. Turkey, unlike in Syria, hasn't really managed to recruit indigenous militia forces simply because the northern Iraq area is majority Kurdish. So Turkey just simply hasn't got the, uh, the, the support to recruit any militias to do its to engage for it. So as a result, we're seeing special forces operations and actual Turkish forces involved in the fighting much more, despite less of them being deployed there. Does Just, Turkey have a permanent presence or bases within northern Iraq? Yes, they have, um, I'd say the more more outposts than there are major military bases, but particularly up here in the Hakurk region, which is where uh, one of the more recent operations have taken place. They've got, multiple, uh, they've got a very significant presence here. Uh, and uh, there's also more outposts along here, but with the proximity to the Turkish border, I think a lot of the operations we'll find are actually cross-border operations. But with these airstrikes taking place often in very remote villages, they don't always feature particularly heavily in uh, local Arabic media. So the Turkish involvement in Iraq has not necessarily slipped on the radar, it's, it's still a very high profile, but it hasn't received quite the same amount of attention that we've seen over in Syria here, where this, it's been a much more volatile region and we've seen much more involvement of Turkey there. And uh, Max, are there any Turkish bases in Iraq? Yeah, there's approximately 11 major military bases in northern Iraq, which Turkey currently controls, as well as uh, a, a number of outposts and smaller bases, which have been set up often on a temporary basis or a much more short term basis. And these have been used as a basis of operations for what we can see in the map right now. The quite large number of special forces and regular forces operations taking place across the country. And Max, uh, we've seen lots of reports, you know, of uh, allegedly merc mercenary use in the Nagorno-Karabakh region and also Libya. Uh, now we know, I know with Libya, uh, Turkish have been, you know, Turkey have been uh, flying in some mercenaries from mm -hmm. Syria. Uh, do we know anything about these mercenaries? Maybe they, you know, their ideology or, or you know, where they sit on that spectrum? Yeah, there's a, big, there's a strong link there actually between Libya and Nagorno-Karabakh because the, the, the mercenaries that are being sent to Libya are from the same Syrian groups that are, that were being used to allegedly send uh, militants to, or mercenaries I should say, to Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh. These are from the Syrian National Army, who we mentioned earlier, which is a, a group of militias in northern Syria. Uh, so, yes, there is some there is some plausibility. And at the start of the conflict, it did appear to be mostly fake news. But we're seeing now we are seeing more and more traces of people referencing the deaths of family members, for example, who took money to go and fight in the Nagorno-Karabakh region, as well as people who perhaps had family links in the area as well. 
the ideology of these groups, again, it's really hard to determine because of these uh, these fighters that we're seeing in Azerbaijan are coming from different militias within the SNA of varying uh, ideologies and stances. Some of them, it is more of a money thing. Uh, the pay is fairly good compared to what they can get in their, in their own, uh, in Syria itself. And others, it's, it's somewhat ideolo ideological. But it's, uh, it's been a bit of a, a misnomer to call them jihadist because the whole, uh, to take money from a foreign country to go and fight elsewhere does in many ways contradict what you could say is jihadist ideology. But nonetheless, you got, it's worth remembering that these SNA rebels in Syria have been involved in a series of uh, uh, human rights abuses. Not all, but it is common to, to see reports of these. So it's worth remembering that these abuses and this this uh, style of fighting, I guess, may be carried into places such as Libya as well as the Nagorno-Karabakh. Hmm. So another military front that Turkey is opening is in Libya. Do you just want to take us through exactly what Turkey is currently um, conducting in the country and what you think their aims are there? Yeah, so I think over the past three years, really, we've seen Turkish support for the UN-backed government um, sort of evolve from beyond, you know, political support and aid giving to a more more military type of support. So we've seen uh, Turkish drones carry airstrikes and uh, Turkey also uh, draft in some Syrian mercenaries. Um, I think they've both played um, a key role, really, in fighting uh, in Western Libya and Tripoli especially. And it's interesting because in January earlier this year, uh, the Turkish parliament, they passed a bill that made way for the deployment of Turkish uh, military units in Libya. And so whereabouts are those military units actually located? Can you show us on the map? Yeah, so if you look on the map uh, here, so right now, Turkey are sort of uh, reinforcing their positions. Uh, at, this is the Watia base in Western Libya. And uh, there were reports earlier this year that uh, I think uh, from a Turkish source uh, that uh, Turkey were negotiating with Libya for two bases. I think this, if there is a, a second base, uh, then it would be in Misrata, just here. Um, we've seen quite a few transport planes, uh, you know, uh, land with military equipment and mercenaries. So that's been the case over here in Misrata. And also uh, mercenaries have uh, arrived in Libya in, I think, civilian aircraft. Uh, from here, then the, they were transported to various bases in Tripoli uh, in, in passenger buses. And so what's the, the military aim of Turkey? What are they trying to achieve? I think that would be uh, linked to the Mediterranean. Uh, I, I believe it may be, you know, uh, oil and gas. Uh, I think that's that would be the motivation over here. Uh, but also, as I'll talk about uh, later on, um, uh, you know, with along with Aaron mm -hmm. about uh, how the you know, various agreements have been signed between Turkey and Libya, or the UN-backed government uh, for uh, the redrawing of maritime boundaries. So Turkey's got itself um, a military presence in, in Libya and it looks like it's looking to expand it with more bases as well. But how much uh, actual influence does Turkey have or is it very much the influence is solely as a result of the military intervention or do they possess a bit of political influence as well? I think they do possess uh, a lot of political influence, mm. uh, especially, uh, you know, within Misrata. Um, I think uh, they're also, because of the role that they played, you know, militarily as well, yeah. you know, with the drone strikes, um, I think they do hold quite a lot of weight now uh, in Libyan uh, politics. So it sounds like the TB2 drone has been effective in changing the balance of forces in Libya. So can you just explain a bit more detail just how and why they've been so effective? So Turkey have developed an impressive range of drones, uh, giving them good tactical range, I think. Uh, so the TB2 have proven to be, you know, they, they conducted quite a few airstrikes that have proven to be pretty effective and decisive, as I previously said. Um, now TB2s are cheap and easy to you know, sort of easy to produce, you know, domestically that they're produced. And um I think also, you know, as opposed to F sixteen fighter jet, you know, there's there's a lot the risk is a lot less you know using a drone. And I think this is why we're seeing more drone usage, you know, as you mentioned in Syria and Iraq as well. Um I think that there was a period, you know, I think during the Tripoli offensive of N of the LNA, where uh, the TB2 carried out a number of airstrikes uh, targeting uh, the SA-22 Panzer missile systems. Uh, and I think this was also notable during the retaking of the Watia Air Base in the West, uh, which I just showed. And um, 
<coughs> successive airstrikes also targeted the LNA's supply lines and uh, LNA fighter jets. Uh, sorry, LNA fighters like gatherings. Uh, now, Russian officials have, you know, I know in, uh, in Syria, you know, when uh, TB2 airstrikes have targeted these Pantsir systems, mm -hmm. they have said they have sort of cited um, uh, the de depletion of ammunition and the lack of battle readiness for, you know, the reason why these uh, airstrikes have been uh, successful. So some were operational, you know, when they were targeted in Libya. And I think this sort of raises the question as to, you know, the, effic the efficacy of the system, but also... I think uh, questions need to be asked about who's operating these systems as well. So I know when uh, the GNA took over the Watia Air Base, uh, there were uh, there was a, a manual uh, for one of these Pantsir missile de missile defense systems found, and this manual was uh, printed in Arabic. So yeah, I think uh, we need to ask about the competency of whoever's operating this as well. Mm -hmm. So it seems like we've got in Nagorno-Karabakh, Russia supporting one side, Turkey supporting the other side. And am I right in saying it's a similar situation in Libya as well? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So taking it more broadly towards Africa and, and Turkey's position, um, you know, what other activities are we seeing Turkey conducting from a foreign policy perspective within the, the broader Africa? Yeah. So, yeah, over the last decade or so, I think we've seen Turkish influence grow uh, significantly in Africa. Uh, and I think this has been the case uh, politically or dip diplomatically, uh, economically and militarily as well. So, uh, and, yeah, and all this also, you know, has notably been the case uh, under Erdogan as well. Uh, just to give an idea of the growth in diplomatic links. Uh, so in 2009, there were only 12 embassies in Africa. Um, uh, these are Turkish embassies. Um, but this has increased to 42. And the number of African embassies in Turkey has increased to 32. So uh, that, that's been the case over the past five years uh, from five. So, yeah, already a re real visible sort of sign of Turkish commitment to the continent. It's interesting sort of the timing of it because you, you had um, you know, Ahmed um, Davutoglu, who was the former academic and became prime minister within Turkey. And it was him who um, sort of created the foreign policy of zero problems with neighbors, where Turkey had actually improved relations with the likes of Syria, Iraq, Iran, and even Iraqi Kurdistan. They tried rapprochement with Armenia, which failed. Um, however, that sort of ended probably around the 2011 period. So it seems around similar times, once the quantity of embassies um, that Turkey had started to increase as mm. they became more um, sort of outward looking um, into the rest of the world. Yeah, so Turkey's uh, involvement, mi military or otherwise, in Africa, has, you know, I think it's also intricately linked to comp complex relations and competition between the uh, competing Middle Eastern blocs. Uh, so I think this is also taking place, you know, on the backdrop of, backdrop of uh, a decrease in U.S. Uh, operations in Africa as well. And uh, we've also seen, you know, during the Trump presidency that uh, we've seen uh, the U.S. Uh, become increasingly disengaged internationally as well. And all of this also, you know, taking place in an emerging sort of multipolar world as well. So, yeah, and I think in relation to the competition between the different blocs in the Middle East, this is not just playing out in North Africa, but it's also playing out on both sides of the Red Sea. So uh, also in the Horn of Africa. And uh, I think this is where Turkey have a military base in Somalia, uh, they're also investing uh, in a strategic port of uh, the Suakin in Sudan. And I think they're also hoping to take over the management of the strategic port of Djibouti as well. Uh, but I think the major change in regional dynamics uh, has come in, in Libya, which has a lot more geostrate geostrategic substance uh, for Turkey, uh, especially since the signing of the maritime agreement between uh, the UN-backed government and Turkey, which established new maritime borders, uh, allowing both countries to sort of jointly launch maritime uh, oil and gas exploration activities and also acquire a position of strength, really, uh, in decisions concerning uh, oil and gas pipelines, such as the East Med pipeline. So energy security is often linked to foreign policy. Um, and I was just reading that Ankara's reliance on gas imports from Azerbaijan has increased by 23% the first half of 2020, which I find interesting when you kind of look at this recent intervention. How much of um, Turkey's foreign policy and intervention in Libya and Africa do you think is linked to energy security? 
So I think for Turkey, you know, it's just a case of trying to maintain balance between, uh, because they're so reliant on, you know, export uh, imports. So I think for them, it's uh, a case of trying to balance out, you know, the different importers maybe. And I think this is uh, something that's sort of uh, common to their thinking uh, in Libya, um, especially with, you know, the signing of the uh, maritime agreement with Libya. Uh, but also, I think the other part of this is that uh, the signing of this maritime agreement, you know, which establishes new maritime uh, boundaries with uh, between Libya and Turkey. Uh, I think a key part of this also is that uh, this agreement gives both Turkey and Libya, and I think Libya as well, uh, geostrategic uh, substance, meaning that both countries, you know, now have, they've acquired a position of strength in uh, any, you know, maritime sort of exploration activities for oil and gas, um, uh, and also for any major decisions, uh, you know, such as the Eastern Med Pipeline that uh, uh, I think um, that they didn't agree to. So, yeah. So that kind of brings us on nicely to the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. um, it appears that a key strategic objective of Turkey within the Mediterranean is part of their um, energy security options. Can you explain how things are playing out currently in the Mediterranean? And I'm thinking in particular an incident of note recently was the collision between the Turkish and Greek navies near Crete. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I can I can pull that up. Yeah, so the incident you mentioned is uh, this one right here. Uh, it was actually reported as an accident where a Turkish survey vessel looking for national resources uh, was uh, escorted by its warships and collided with a with a Greek warship. Um, these types of incidents are not that rare. Um, there's a lot of military activity. So all of the incidents that you see on the map right now is uh, related to military activity. Um, and what it's all about, in essence, is the gas deposits that are found in this corner of the Eastern Mediterranean. And Turkey, like you said, wants to be less dependent on other countries. So it wants to... Uh, extract these resources, um, but other countries want to do this as well. And uh, one area where the dispute is about is the varying maritime claims. So if we take a look at this map, you can see that the maritime claims of Greece, Turkey and Cyprus heavily overlap. And uh, this is basically since Erdogan's uh, presidency, this has been uh, brought to the forefront, he has um, introduced the concept of Mavi Natan, Mavi Vatan, which means uh, blue homeland. And basically, his aim is to defend this territory of uh, Turkey in the Mediterranean and to uh, to extract the gas resources there. How does that sort of fit in with international maritime law? Yeah, so in terms of international law, Greece is part of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. And this allows it to draw its maritime boundary around its islands, which is great for Greece because it has hundreds of tiny islands. Um, for Turkey, that's of course not great because it's completely locked out of the agency and uh, it's stuck in this corner of the Mediterranean. So Turkey hasn't signed up to this convention of the law of the sea. It's um, instead approaching this via the, the, the blue homeland concept, which it's it's very vague. It's kind of similar to what's been happening with China in the South Chinese Sea. Um, but it's trying to, based on historical references, claim this, this area as its own. But the problem is, because it's not signed up to the convention, cannot be taken to court that easily, to like the International Court of Justice, mm -hmm. like China was. Um, not that that would help much, but um, Really, the, the only solution here is to find a com political compromise uh, that's been happening now. So they have uh, Germany is uh, very adamant to find a political solution to this issue. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be sort of three key areas within the Mediterranean. There's one is the, the whole Greek islands and how they establish their maritime border, which Turkey disagree with. You've also got the issue of Cyprus as well. So you know, northern Cyprus was occupied by Turkey in 1974 with the justification of protecting the island's Turkish-speaking uh, minority after a Greek-backed coup occurred. And I think that's a key issue as well. So you just kind of explain to us exactly what is happening here in terms of that boundary that's being drawn that appears to completely encircle yeah. Cyprus. Yeah. So um, basically, uh, the Republic of Cyprus uh, is saying uh, that it has this uh, light blue uh, maritime boundary. Turkey says, no, um, 
the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus actually should have equal access to the national natural resources in the area. So it's all about what's below the sea, uh, not necessarily what's on top of it or the islands. It's all about the national resources. So Turkey says we, they have to be divided equally. So that's the green boundary that you see. So the blue one, um, from my understanding, it's that you draw a boundary up to, is it 200 kilometers? Yeah, it's a certain distance uh, from your um, coast. So if you have lots of islands or a long coastline, that's ideal. Whereas in the northern um, line, it, um, when there's two territories, they actually take the median, so it's a halfway point. Yeah. So do you think this situation could sort of escalate into a conflict, maybe? Um, well, like I showed, there's a lot of military activity. Um, so I think there's the, definitely the potential for escalation in terms of more of these types of accidents that you see. I don't think the conflict will develop into an actual military conflict. I think there will be nobody benefits from a mil military conflict. So everybody wants to find sort of a solution. But the problem is Turkey is a NATO ally, but it hasn't been really acting as one. So I think the conflict is also very politically charged in terms of NATO, uh, where, um, you know, the incursions into Syria, um, what is doing now in Azerbaijan, but also in the Mediterranean. I think both both parties need each other and they need each other too much, like Europe needs, uh, or EU member states and NATO needs Turkey for its geographical location, also to manage migration. Uh, so I think in the end, there will be a political solution. And that's what we're seeing developing now, where Germany is kind of mediating between all parties, trying to find a solution to this Mediterranean problem. So what do you think they're trying to achieve by actually linking up with Libya? Yeah, so to hear um, Faraj can maybe jump in. But uh, so as you can see, Turkey conveniently drew its boundary to link up with Libya and that small area. And that's where they can draw a pipeline and sort of lock off the other countries. Because on the other side are Greece, Cyprus, but also Egypt and Israel, who are trying to um, uh, in increase their defense cooperation. So you have these two parties on both sides trying to lock each other out of the uh, resources. Thanks for that, Aaron. So on today's episode of The Insight, we've covered the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. We then spoke about Syria and Iraq and Turkey's involvement there. And um, we've also sp spoken about uh, Libya, as well as um, Turkey's foreign policy involvement linked to its energy security, as well as its use of drones. And finally, we've looked at the Mediterranean and Turkey's push to increase their maritime zone in order to claim natural resources. Um, Thanks for watching the episode. If you liked it, please like, share and subscribe um, and follow our channel for the next episode.